Hi there, this is Orton Persa. I'm a science fiction illustrator, but I'm also a deep sea ecologist. And what I would like to show you in this video is how it is to work on an ice breaking research vessel. Uh, in this case, for a long two month cruise that I took last year towards the South Pole when we tried to reach the place where the big iceberg A68 had broken off from the, um, the shelf ice. Our purpose was to see how the seafloor had responded to the lack of giant ice coverage which has been there since before humans were here. So this is the ship, the research vessel Polarstern, 110 meters long, um, the biggest research icebreaker in the world. And it's the Germans um, uh, organized ship, German coordinated ship with two helicopters on top. And here we can see it's stuck in the ice. So um, our cruise was, um, leaving from South America, as we can see on the map coming up. Yeah, so we were on the, uh, South America and we were going to go all the way down to the Antarctic Pen Peninsula. We were leaving from Chile, which is um, in the port of um, Santiago, uh, uh, um, Punta Arenas near the south of Chile. And we were gonna go down past the South Shetland Islands to the Antarctic Peninsula, which is mostly ice covered on the right side. So here's the ship in harbour. As with many of these cruises, one of our cranes was broken. So we actually sat in harbour for the first seven or eight days of the cruise. And we couldn't actually get started till a little bit into the mission. It's often like this. You're often sitting around waiting for something to be fixed. That's actually a video for the RV website I'm taking right now. You're also taking a video, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That last clip was us getting on the ship and then when we were on the ship we're finally going across the Drake Passage which is one of the very busiest points um, crossings in the world so here we can see uh, busiest for waves that is so we have very rough seas and most of those people we saw in the photographs just now are mostly being sick about now. So that we're looking from about 30 meters above sea level I'm on the bridge here when I took this video it doesn't look so wavy, but you can see it pretty much is. Here we're going up one, and then we're going to come back down, and the wave is actually going to hit the bridge. <laughs> What's up? So on the other side of the Drake Passage, you get to um, the gateway to the Antarctic. And here we are going through a little gap between a few islands. Um, that's uh, Rosamel Island you see there at the top left. This is a volcanic cone plug and uh, it's absolutely beautiful island and, and here we have lots of the ice that's breaking up in Antarctica getting stuck or slowly drifting through this gap into the southern ocean where it's um, going to be smashed up by the waves and get to about 60 north and then be lost. So this ice is all new ice, it's all formed this year, it's quite thin. So here we can see the map of where we went on the cruise. That video we were just looking at is where the red line sort of um, goes around that corner. Oh, this is a journey back actually. This is a, this is a course back. But you can see the Antarctic Peninsula there and the, where we finally got to. So as soon as you pass the Antarctic Peninsula, you start getting quite a few penguins, emperor penguins or Adelie penguins in this case. And you watch these little guys trying to avoid the ship and jump up onto the ice. Some of them get a bit lost, especially that guy on the right. So as we went further and further south towards our destination, the ice conditions got worse and worse and worse and worse. And here we can see a GoPro lowered over the side of the ship, filming how it goes. Thank <laughs> you. 
here we can see a view from the bridge again as we slowly try and get through the ice. So this is where we finally gave up our attempt to reach the A68 iceberg with the ship. We just got stuck in the ice and we could only go back and forwards a couple of hundred meters. So we were ramming and ramming and ramming the ice. So someone put a GoPro on the bridge and we could film it here. So this is much speeded up. This, the ship is not going that fast. It's going quite fast. Maybe it takes a minute or uh, half a minute to reverse and then to charge forward into the ice. And as you can see, we're trying to break through this ice, even though it looks quite thin, the ice, you can see all these lumpy bits. These lumpy bits are where broken bits of ice are pushed together. And sometimes as they push together, some of the ice is pushed underneath the other ice, which can end up making quite a thick piece of ice, maybe 10 meters, we found at this place. Now our ship, the Polar Stone, despite being the biggest and the best, it can only really break, break one meter or two meter thick ice readily. And these pressure ridge type accumulations of ice underneath the vessel made it very difficult to break through. So I leave this whole video here for you. This is very frustrating to watch it again and again. And you can zoom forward four minutes if you want, and then I'll start talking about the actual mission.
So as we were breaking that ice, we we're making quite a lot of holes in the in the ice. And here, whales like this fin whale, this mink whale, sorry, you can see here, are coming up out of the ice. So here you can see the stomach of a mink whale coming up very close to the, to the ship. And you can see all that red staining on the underside. Now that's the krill, the animals which the whale eats. And of course, when you eat something, you have to get rid of the waste product and they make these extremely pink and stinking waste deposits. On the ship, we do all sorts of things to keep occupied. So here, for example, there's table tennis, which the more civilized members of the crew might do. Um, we actually had one of our injuries here. Someone broke their leg playing table tennis. If you feel like it, you can take part in the parties. So we have a party usually at the start. So the scientists and the crew meet each other. Then this is the midway party. By the midway party here, we still hadn't really reached our iceberg destination. You can dance badly if you want to. And then you can relax with a hangover in the red lounge on the ship. Here is the, um, the lounge for the scientists where you can read a book or whatever you want to do. So when we got to the most southern point, we started trying to find a way through the ice and we'd use one of our helicopters for that. So we had two helicopters and we'd fly up and try and find gaps in the ice just nearby the ship so we could decide where to go. Didn't really have much luck with that, so we decided to fly the helicopters directly to A68, the massive iceberg that was in the news last year, and here we are flying along the side of it. More than 40 meters out of the ice, so hundreds of meters of ice would be below this iceberg. This is the different bedding paint planes in the ice. This would have been shelf ice that's broken off and floated to the cross. So this is us flying over that iceberg, the only people who've ever done that. And then you land on the ship. Quite an easy landing for the pilots here because we are not moving very much, but they do use it even when they're in the waves still to some extent. Personally, I love going on the helicopter. And of course, the best thing about going on the helicopter is you can take some of the best selfies in the world and also you get to wear extremely attractive outfits, which are obviously based on X-Wing pilot outfits. And inside the helicopter too. So, and you have these things you can plug in to listen to each other. So the real work is this. This is my device. This is the OFOS, OFOBS, Ocean Floor Observation and Bathymetry System. Basically, it's a towed camera and sonar system which I drag up behind the ship and tell the captain where to go, left, right, or whatever. And I take photographs of the seafloor with this and video of the seafloor with this. So here we see a map of the deployments we actually went to, um, starting with the most fervently south one. So here we see the ice. This is the seafloor underneath uh, the ice. Yeah, it's quite boring and muddy in this location. Quite a lot of uh, muddy photographs, a few fish. It's the sort of images I'm taking. They're actually 26 megapixel images when you actually see the real ones. So they're actually quite high resolution. So here you can see me and my bitchin' haircut working and uh, I've got these various monitors set up and I can see the seafloor and nearby me I have a winch controller and I can tell him to move my device up or down or we can talk to the bridge and tell if we want to go left or right. And this has got the sonar output in front of me there. So we go on to the next location now. Which was again muddy but there's bits of stones around the place and when there's bits of stones you get life attached to the stones, sponges, corals, things like that. So you get a different habitat niche 
There you can see a sea cucumber, that strange looking thing in the middle there. And here a crinoid, look at this thing swimming. So these are the crinoids that HP Lovecraft based uh, the Elder Things on, these multiple armed swimming uh, uh, creatures, one of the oldest forms of life on Earth. So here we have a boulder that's been heavily populated by life. Very, very many things. There's probably 30 or 40 species on that particular boulder. Corals, bryzoans, holotherians, um, everything. Many, many different sorts of animals will be living on this. So here we see another one of these holotherians there. These sea cucumbers, they eat everything on the seafloor and then they just shit it out behind them. Okay, now we're going a little bit further north to the by the uh, entrance to Antarctica where you see those islands there above. So again, it's muddy, lots of these ophroid starfish, a few stalk corals, and then we have fish living in these holes underneath these boulders. You can see that also in this particular image, there's quite a lot of discoloration around the stones. So these are, there's obviously something reworking the sediment somehow there. Bits of seaweed also you can see there. In another location, very close to that previous one. But again, muddy, but hundreds of starfish here, just under the ground, under the mud. So they're just underneath the mud there. So for much of this cruise, unfortunately, we were at the mercy of the ice and we were drifting very slowly here. So I wasn't really pulling my camera as much as letting it drift. And you can see that there's more and more things in the water columns. Now these are shrimps brought in because of my lights attracting them. So now we're going a little bit further north again, but still in the Antarctic area. So here we're at an area called um, the Nactigala Shoal. So it goes from deep to very shallow, just 20 meters below seafloor from 1600. You see a giant sea spider there, lots of eggs of different animals. So this area was very interesting because um, we have lots of different animals at different depths. So lots of corals there, sponges. Most of these things are the orange things there, mostly sponges or soft corals. And here you can see where the icebergs have dragged along the seafloor. You can see these lines maybe in this picture here. So this is where an iceberg has crashed into the seafloor. Remember, 90% of an iceberg is underwater. So if it's 60 meters thick or 50 meters thick, you might get another 400 or so meters underneath the water. So you can see here again these linear features where the iceberg has just ripped everything away and starfish have been occupying it. And again, the same here. So if you're an animal that lives attached to the seafloor, maybe it's not the best place to live. And these white cauliflower-like things are soft corals which are occupying the uh, newly disturbed bits of the seafloor here. So we're getting shallower and shallower as we go here. And then there's huge boulders of sort of muddy material that's been knocked off by the icebergs and has been pushed about the place. Bits of seaweed you can also see stuck in the grooves there, this dark material from sh higher up on the shoal. Yeah, as we're going shallow and shallow, you can see a fish there, quite well camouflaged in the centre. Now we're getting to see the algae actually growing, so red algae is usually the deeper algae, the light that it needs can penetrate further, green algae is usually shallower, so you can see quite a few different sorts of algae here in this image. So here we're getting quite shallow, the captain got quite nervous. This is red algae growing at just 25 meters below the ice, so just about five or 10 meters below the ship. Um, so even in the Antarctic, in the areas which are usually completely ice covered, you can still manage to get enough light for, uh, for photosynthesis, which is quite interesting. So we're moving again further out from the peninsula. And we're back into muddy seafloor. But you can see there's more burrows here. There's things that are living underneath the sediments. They're drilling down into it to make their lives. And again, we're really stuck in the ice, so we're really having a lot of animals swimming in. So what I usually do now is I turn my lights off and drift for two or three minutes, and then they get bored and go away. Lots of fish there coming in probably to eat the things that have been attracted by my lights. So now we're just going outside the protection of the Antarctic Peninsula, the white land. 
And now we've got a very muddy area, very muddy, and these huge sea anemones that you can see there that are not really attached to the seafloor. Sea anemones are actually mobile animals. If they don't like what's going on, they can just disconnect themselves and float off somewhere else, or in this case, roll fatly along the seafloor to find somewhere else to live. So now we're really jumping up to, you can see the blue area on the right, That's the that, that area there is called the Powell Basin. So here we've got very deep seafloor and cliffs on the sides. So here you can see immediately it's very different. There's no mud, it's very rocky seafloor here. Lots of ophoroids, lots of small stones. And here on the cliff edges you can see that these uh, very occupied with sponges, things like that, wherever you get a, a sudden a sudden break on the seafloor, you get very much filter feeding animals. You can see them here, many sponges, corals clinging to the sides of these cliffs. So you're the first people that have ever seen these videos. I haven't shown them uh, these images. I haven't really shown them out to anyone yet. We're still working on publishing the science and writing it all up. So there is uh, sea squirts. There's all sorts of things there. Definitely things I've never seen before. So my camera that I'm taking these images with, um, it's got a side scan sonar, so I can see if I'm getting too close to the cliff and I can avoid the cliff then, but no one else has got a device like this. So I've taken images closer to the cliff side than anybody has been able to accomplish before. So that's making this data set pretty unique. Big blue octopus there in the center. Uh, another stone with things on the sides. Again, very, very heavily colonized, the stones. Here's a bit of a close up with a fish swimming, swimming across. You can see so much life there. So this is an illustration that I did of the seafloor. So um, I put the latitude and longitude of where I was. I did this for the whole cruise. I took a number of sketches of the different locations. The life, it, like you saw there, was is that dense in some of these images. So we're still in the rocky area, north the Powell Basin cliff flanks. But the surface, on the surface, it looks very still and calm and collected. Here we have the marginal ice zone. So we're at the edge of the permanent ice where the ice is always quite thin. Uh, moving around in pretty large plates, 50 meters across maybe those plates are. You can't really tell where the sky starts and where the ice ends. Much like the last place, lots of different life on the rocks. Look how beautiful this is, these eight or nine legged octopus, uh, um, uh, uh, starfish. You can see these echinoids, anemones. A riot of colour and lifestyles here, bazingids, encrusting worms, there's so much life down there, so many different types, and a lot of it is depending on depth. So when I'm taking these images, I'm going across a number of depth ranges, and we have different bands of different organisms at particular depths. Like here we see for about 10 metres depth window, we see many, many of these yellow soft corals, and also these smaller orange corals that have got a, a, um, a solid uh, shell, uh, you know, they a cow, cow, uh, skeleton, so. and this would just be for 10 metres. Thousands of starfish there on the last image, here we see a black coral poking out from behind a sponge on the cliff side. Huge coverage again of corals mostly, um, stylasterid, slow growing white corals amongst a load of ovaroid starfish. So this is broken up volcanic rock. So this area here is obviously volcanic at some point in the past and you can see that on here again corals and sponges and the like. You can see a particular density on the flank of the outcrop. And then we're moving on to our most northerly sampling station. It's after six weeks into our cruise now, everyone's getting tired. Best alcohol is sold from the shop. And now you can see it's quite like gravel at this location. So it's shallow, it's about 800 meters. It's much like you might see on a fairly pebbly beach. And then we also have occasional larger stones in here as well. So it's a big volcanic stone there with a few bits of life on there. Maybe it's not been there very long because it's not particularly highly colonised. Flow conditions are probably quite fast because there's not too much mud. More stones. So I've got 20,000 images from this cruise. If you want to come and help me annotate all of those, there's an anemone sitting on one of these rocks. So we're starting to go back now towards uh, leaving the area. Just one more chance to have another good look at a cliff. Again, 
Huge amount of glass sponges, those ones. It's a silicate sponges. You can see a crinoid on the edge of one of those ones there. Yeah, there's a sea urchin there in the middle there. Well, there's everything pretty much in this image. Shrimps on some strange sponges. Another shrimp next to some strange, I guess they're sponges. So a lot of these things no one has seen before. So I, my job now is to go and get particular experts from around the world to come in and look at these things. So um, I am doing octopuses myself and I'm also doing the deaths of large creatures. So here we can see in the next image a dead whale that I filmed here. You can see there's some uh, things eating the bones but it's been dead for quite a while. This whale is dangling on the side of this cliff, this skeleton here. I forced the colours a little bit to make it more visible so it's quite dark in the original image. So here we see the sort of video I collect from the seafloor. So this is the live video feed that I would collect at the same time as I'm taking the photo. When you see the flashes, that's those photographs. Every 10 seconds or so I'm taking the photograph. And um, the high resolution photograph, that's all my batteries or my power supply can handle. So the rest of the time I'm just recording videos. So we did two dives of more than 24 hours, which I sat through pretty much completely. So here we have again the workstation where I can see the forward looking, the thing that's like a looks like a fan is actually my forward looking sonar so I can tell if I'm going to crash into something. You can see the sort of coke and stuff we live on when we're doing this. Um, but it's not all acoustics we all, and uh, photographs. You also need to take direct samples. So here's a photograph of those of us that were collecting the real animals from the seafloor. So if you collect the real animals then you know what they actually are. You can get experts to look at it and identify it. So we would collect them and um, we would take the samples like this. It's like a, it looks like a delicious Asian dinner maybe, but it's like a load of ophroids and different sorts of things in here. The tiny octopuses, sponges, pebbles. And then we get on the ship, we sort them out into the general categories of what they are. So all of the starfish go in one particular jar from each location and then the real experts back at home can sort it all out. So in the background you can see the chief scientist wearing a shirt with letters on. He doesn't know or care about this stuff because he's actually a geologist. So he looks on in disgust as the rest of us sort through all these animals. So here's one of these deep sea fish when he comes up. Maybe the eyes expanded a little bit or maybe he does look that ugly anyway. So I'm not really a fish expert. So we have different experts on the ship. We have a, in this case a Belgian fish expert. So he took care of all the fish. Here's an octopus. So it's a insurate octopus, which means that it's like a Dumbo octopus. Here I am pretending to know what I'm talking about, looking at this octopus. Yeah, and then this one would have been sent away now for analysis, probably in Paris or in uh, England at the Natural History Museum. I forget where this particular one went. So we had people from the British Antarctic Survey on the ship. It's always international. You always have people from all different countries, different experts from different places. Yeah, so this is us at last dive, just getting ready to go back. And as the season goes on, you get towards polar night, so then you need your massive floodlights that we have on the ship. So you can see where you're going. The, 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 the pilots of the ship are looking for gaps in the ice to try and make things go smoother. So we didn't just have my camera we also had um, a small robot on the sea on the ship which we could send down to the bottom to look at stuff and this is a video that the robot team put together I'm not exactly sure why they put the music from the exorcist on it but there you go so I'll let you sit through this if you want to watch that these are from the most southerly stations the muddy stations and they're filming from a different angle so it's actually pretty interesting to compare with my photographs which are all taken from directly above That white thing is a siphonophore, it's a bit like a jellyfish, uh, but attached to the seafloor directly. This starfish is massive, he must be 70 centimetres across. So many things in the Antarctic take a long time to grow, but when they do grow they get very big.
good thing about these sort of robots is you can really see how things are interacting on the seafloor. What lives on what, what lives underneath what. Well, that video is quite interesting, but my god, that music was annoying. So at the edge of the ice, we still had the whales near us, so here's a bit of a video footage of that. Not exactly scared of people. Oh, yeah, last chance to see some penguins. Here yeah, it's another video of the penguins. In this case, <laughs> Some of them find it easier than others to jump up. And here it is again. <laughs> Almost as cute as Baby Yoda. So yeah, so the last days going back, we're just checking on the broken feet of our colleague who broke his toes playing uh, table tennis. Finish off a sketch of us stuck in the ice and then we uh, start smashing our way back.
So as it approaches Polar Night, we get these absolutely beautiful views. This is here, um, one of the another one of the larger islands down there in the Antarctic Peninsula Gateway. And then Rosamel as we were leaving, so the sun's much lower than it was when we arrived six weeks before. Pretty dramatic, and this is without any colour modifications or anything like that. So I've been on 16 cruises so far, and definitely the Antarctic is the most beautiful. So after getting the helicopter to pick up anybody left behind, we were starting to leave, and then we had a massive storm crossing the Drake Passage, 14 metre waves. There was pretty a lot of seasick people then. So I'm going to finish off now with a 12 or 13 minute walk around the ship that my colleague made, Simon, um, Simon Dritter there in front. He is uh, the guy in charge of my side scan sonar system on my camera. So he, him and his friends, they took a camera and they walked all over the lift of the ship. Again, annoying music. Here's our swimming pool where we play water polo and the sauna is through there. There's the gym there. German sauna, you gotta be naked. So this is the engineering deck, one of the, the, the uppermost of the three or four engineering decks. All the water stored there for emergencies. It would look like we might have got stuck there over winter at one point and so we need extra supplies just in case. All these doors can be sealed, seal off separate sections of the ship. This is the sort of day room for the workers. This is the working deck out on the back where we put all of our different instruments. All our winches and equipment. This is the main A-frame at the back for lowering devices overboard. And quite fast here. eight or nine or ten or eleven knots. That's the thing for collecting the animals from the seafloor, that's for collecting mud from the seafloor. They've been getting stowed up, tied down so we don't lose it or have it smashed about when we, when we were at sea. So the left hand side here are mostly the labs, they're mostly locked now. You lock them up when you finish working. This is the acoustics room where the ship's sonar is used. There's 100 people on the ship, 50 crew and 50 scientists. This is the main gangway between the working deck outside and then large interior areas for designing equipment, fixing equipment. And these big uh, normal containers, some of them, but some of them are lab containers so you can do all your work in there. Fallout t-shirt, it's kind of embarrassing. This is one of our bars. This is the Zillatal, it's um, a place and a, and a dining room. So this is our bar, it's done out like a Swiss chalet. That's where we sit there and have drinks every other night. So the scientists work as barmen and or bar ladies and um, the ship's doctor allows us to have a certain amount of alcohol each night. Quite generous usually.
So this is uh, the only part of the ship I've never been on. This is right at the front. You've got to get special permission to go up here because there's no safety rails. I've never been up there in spending... I spent 2% of my life on this ship. I've never been up there. Those are the, co uh, the rooms on the right hand side, the cabins, they're two people per cabin on the Polar Stern, so everyone's sharing, except the crew, they get a single cabin each, and the chief scientist, they get a cabin to themselves. This is the helicopter deck, where you can get a lift up from the sauna, and you can uh, stand out in the snow straight after the sauna, which is pretty awesome. Here's our two helicopters. Yeah, this is the cabin, so you can just see a cabin here. Go inside the cabin, there you go, you got your little table, it's quite nice inside. You got bunk beds, one on top, one on the bottom. You got your survival suits in there, things like that. It's the red saloon where you saw me earlier with the beer, and then this is our dining room there. Now, ah, this is one of our lifts. So there's several lifts, actually three lifts on the ship, one for equipment, one small one that seems to be the only purpose is to go from the sauna to the deck, and then a normal lift. You do walk on a lot of stairs on these ships, which is good, because the food is usually pretty heavy and pretty delicious, so you put on even more weight if you didn't do quite so much walking. The blue saloon where you have fancy meetings or when the ship's in harbour they have ambassadors and all that sort of stuff come there. Lifeboats. Each lifeboat can take 50 people. We've got four lifeboats, so each side of the ship can manage to support all the people on the ship if it needs to. Many cranes. That's a really high crane. That's for putting equipment onto the ice for the Antarctic stations when you're supplying food to the people that live there all year round, which is one of the things the ship does. Next bit's called the Monkey Island, which is the bit on top of the bridge, so we're really quite high up up here. And this is the big radar dishes. The yellow sign means don't go inside there if you want to stay fertile, that's what they tell us. And then, uh, yeah, so this is the view from the top there. This is where we usually go if it's a nice day, if there's something exciting to see, or if there's a load of whales, people will go up there. We're going onto the bridge where the captain and nautical officers hang out, and then some doing some electricity, electricity, uh, electricity. So you've got all around windows up here. It's a very, very big room. It's great. And you can go up here any time on this particular ship as long as you're quiet.
We're going to go past the weather office now, I think, yes. So this is where we have two people from the meteorological office on the left here. So we have actual weather forecasters here that help with prediction of global weather, things like that. They work in there. So now this lady, she is going to climb up to the crow's nest, which you need to put a clip on. It's very, very tall and steep, a safety harness to go all the way up here. And here is what's bad if you're seasick. If you're going up here and you get remotely seasick, you're going to be sick. It's small, it's high, it moves the most on the ship. So people like whale observers, they would come up here if your work is looking for whales or something else on the sea surface, you may come up here. Outside on the very top of the ship. What a beautiful ship. So it's uh, it's the same age as me as well. It's 46 years old, same as me. You yeah, know, I said I spent more than two percent of my life on it. By next year, I think I'll have spent three percent, something like this. So, yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that banner on that video, but there you go. And sorry about the music on that video as well. Yeah. So that's a little insight into what it's like to live on one of these ships. The sort of science that I do on one of these ships. And I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to finish off with um, a photograph of one of the nice octopuses that I found on the seafloor. So this is one of the many colourful species that we saw down there. Quite camouflaged, quite hard to tell. It's an octopus straight away. Don't know if it's new to science or yet. We're investigating all that now. So thanks a lot for watching this video. I hope you have a nice convention. All the best and see you again. Bye.